co-moderator and co-conspirator, Leslie Dunlap. Leslie, thank you again for doing this with me. This is, I think, our one-year anniversary of this program, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Okay, so um, tonight's topic is titled, uh, Should Historians Be Pundits? And so it's a broader topic than what we've been looking into. Usually in these programs, we look at a specific current event and we try to look at its historical context and provide some historical commentary on this. But for tonight's program, I wanted to get into this broader topic about basically whether we should even be doing this. Um, because that's a question that's been genuinely and honestly posed by some people. And I, I, in uh, the lead up to this, I circulated um, some links to some articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post. The Atlantic has had some material in here where basically people have been saying either historians should be involved in political discussions and debates or keep your noses out of it and go back to the classroom or go back to your books. That's a, obviously an exaggeration of both sides of that debate. But in any case, I wanted to talk about that because that's really at some level what we're doing and we've been trying to do in History in the News is to make it relevant. And in some cases, you have plenty of people that have been on this stage who have been acting as pundits. Um, so I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. And we have an all-star panel tonight. I sent an email to everybody who had been a panelist uh, on previous programs and had five people who said they could do it, plus one new one. And I want to introduce the new one first. This is Andra Chastain, who grew up in Salem. Did you raise your hand, Andra? There she is. Um, she grew up in Salem, and she's a PhD candidate in Latin American history at Yale University. She is currently completing a dissertation about the history of the subway in Santiago, Chile which has been supported by the Social Science Research Council. That's a really big deal, everybody, if you didn't know. <laughs> Her research interests include urban political history, history of science and technology, and the transnational Cold War. Please welcome Andra to the stage. All right, you've seen these other nerds before, so I'm not gonna give them the full treatment with the biography. So we've got Ellen Eisenberg over here in the middle, Dwight and Margaret Ruth Custer of American History at Willamette University. Kim Jensen, hi Kim, thank you for coming. From Western Oregon University. Fabulous research, fabulous books from Kim. She was just here a couple months ago, as a matter of fact. Thanks for coming back. David Lewis, a tribal anthropologist, member of the Grand Grand Tribe, and has a PhD from the University of Oregon. Barbara Mahoney. Hi, Barbara. Thank you for coming again. Barbara served as adjunct faculty, and she also just recently wrote the Salem Clique, or Salem Clique, Oregon's founding brothers. And then finally, Fred Thompson. Fred Thompson from EGSM, Atkinson Graduate School of Management. Uh, a fantastic panel. Make sure to read their entire biographies again, which are online. But let's get into the heart of the matter. What do you think, Leslie? Let's do it. Okay, I wanted to start with one question for the whole audience. How many of you have enjoyed this series? <laughs> yeah! Okay, why? Tell me why. Informative. What's that? Informative. It's informative, okay? Well, I haven't told you, Bob, that it gives me a perspective on current times and it makes me feel a little bit more hopeful and less desperate. Uh, perspective on current times and more hopeful and less desperate. Okay, maybe one more suggestion about why you've enjoyed this program. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Taproot. Taproot being here, that's also another thing. Okay, sure good. I want you to think about that when you all receive in the mail the letter asking you for money to support the Willamette Heritage Center, how much you love the place. But, I, but I'm, this is really interesting, Melanie, what you said about giving you some perspective and making you feel better about where we are in the present. That somehow, and we talked about this on the radio this morning, that you know we see or we can sort of interpret or, or think that we see um, uh, uh, examples in the past, analogies. And for those of you who read the articles in preparation for tonight, um, some people are a little concerned that we're, being a little, we're playing a little too fast and loose with historical analogies. So, um, and that might be one of the concerns. But uh, I, I think though that what you're kind of saying, Melanie, is that you're, are you comfortable with historians being pundits for opining on political yeah. issues? Okay, Melanie is. Um, maybe I can have a, a quick show of hands. Who in the room is comfortable with historians opining on political issues? Okay, most of you, but not all, but not all. There is a question here. How about up here, in, among you? Who is comfortable with scholars and historians being pundits for opining on political? Okay, every one of you, every one of you. Could you talk about why? Why should historians be pundits? 
What do you think? Okay, you hear now? You hear now? So um, I was going to do this later, but I think I'll do it now, just in case I forget. Bob? Bob? Yeah. For your uh, all your years of service, because you're leaving this area. Well, thanks, dude. Oh, jeez. Now you're in uniform. <laughs> As unexpected, very nice, but it's not going to get you out of the question. <laughs> so, why should historians opine on 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 politics or get involved in political conversations? Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons. Uh, our president doesn't apparently read, so uh, <laughs> usually now. So he needs to. Uh, well, that's what he said, or some people say about him. Perhaps the pundits say that about him, but. Um, but I really, I really like to see uh, people talk about how uh, some of the what's happening today is similar to the past, even though it may not be exactly the same. So um, I think that people do need that historical perspective. A lot of folks are not getting that in schools, mainly because social sciences are kind of on the outs right now in schools. And so I'd like to see, uh, you know, um, I think a lot of people want to hear that perspective even though they're not getting it in school and stuff. So. Yeah, I, I would agree and, and um, maybe ask who better to, to comment than historians. Not on the future, I tell my students when they ask me for predictions, I do the past, I don't do the future. Um, but I think who better to be able to come up with analogies that are sound. So one of the articles, I don't know how many of you did the homework, uh, but the New York Times article that was for homework presented a series of bad analogies that may have, may or may not have been presented by actual historians. Um, and then said on that basis, well, therefore historians shouldn't be pundits. I think the point is that um, historians, when doing punditry well, are able to come up with uh, stronger analogies that are useful and also able to um, differentiate between, you know, how, how are the circumstances then different from the circumstances now. How do you distinguish between bloviating and punditry? <laughs> All sorts of people bloviate. That means uh, talk about uh, things that are uh, of, of current interest. And they have a lot of opinions, most of them ill-informed. The idea of punditry is that a pundit actually knows something and has something to communicate. Now, I think I can say this perhaps with more objectivity than some of the members of the panel because I am not primarily a historian, but an economist. And I can look at the historian and say, yes, a historian has expertise, which allows them to speak with certain authority about uh, past events and drawing analogies from past events to the present. Now, almost any time one talks about what will happen, what might happen, what is happening. One is implicitly um, extrapolating from some source event to a current event. Historians, perhaps more than any other uh, discipline, are trained to do that, to extrapolate from past events to the present. One of the best things that they could do as pundits is tell us how stupid some analogies are because they, in fact, are trained to discriminate between good analog historical analogies and bad ones. And let me assure you that most globiation uh, includes a lot more bad analogies than good ones. How do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that the articles, uh, particularly the one against historians being pundits, took a, a a totally mundane approach. I think that, unfortunately, recent events are suggesting, as David said, that our citizens don't know enough about history. <laughs> and I'm hoping very much that that will be corrected. Um, history has a lot to say about what's going on. And I very much hope 
that you will be looking into it and that you you don't need to learn anything from it or you, you wouldn't be here. But uh, I think that in general, our society needs to know more. Um, I think everyone can hear me all right. Um, so I, I generally agree with the rest of the people on the, on the panel that um, historians ought to be pundits, as you know, pundits are specialized experts, and with that, you know, we are positioned to offer our um, knowledge and, and expertise on certain subjects. But sort of to counter a little bit of what's being said, maybe um, I think especially we're especially well positioned to understand the limits of our expertise, um, more so than you know TV anchors or other so-called pundits. Um, and I think that's especially true, kind of thinking about the aftermath of the elections and all of the sort of hubris of experts who thought they know exactly what was going on. And I think this is, I mean, that's one of the better points in the article in the New York Times that a lot of us disagreed with, this idea that past events do not repeat exactly as we think that they should and that they're, you know, to sort of give nuance to the historical picture and to understand the limits of expertise, I think we're well positioned to do that, but to still say that in the public sphere. I'd like you to think about in your own life, your own education, when you made the journey from history being the right answer to history being a, con a consideration of varying points of view and trying to understand different points of view. I think complicating the past and helping people see that there is no right answer is what we do. Often for my students, especially at the in, you know, first year level, that's very hard because they've learned how to be successful by finding some right answer without a lot of critical thinking. And really what we're inviting people to do is to think critically uh, about the past and present, which uh, is sorely needed, desperately needed at this point. I also think that as I think about my colleagues in political science and sociology, particularly we've been mentioning this, their job is to predict. Their job is to model, their job is to say, we see these variables and we suggest that this will happen. And historians are famous for not doing that. But what we can do is to say, in this very complicated situation, it's important to know what's happened in the past and what's been there. And we, many of us, I know I've had the experience of writing 500 words for an exhibit card, when there should be 50,000 words, <laughs> or having an interview that the editors decide they're gonna use one minute on a TV show. And so the question is, do we decide to do that or not? Because they'll, they're not complicating what we say. We're, we're insisting that it's complex. My hope is that we can entice people enough to be interested enough to learn more about that. And I know that doesn't always happen, but if, if we can get that interest and pique that interest and help people think about why understanding the past would be helpful in this context, I think we can then you know, bring them into reading 5,000 words or 10,000 you know, at the end. I also think um, it's important, especially now, when so many people are making political claims on the basis of history, um, just as for an example, oh, it's the biggest X ever, or it is, um, this is the biggest witch, the witch hunt speech. ever, the best speech ever, this has never happened before, I'm unprecedented. Um, those kind of historical claims on all political sides are being made, and historians can weigh in on those and say whether those are, um, you know, um, put those into perspective. And I think, too, it's important um, to think about how tradition is often invoked, but it's also being invented, too. And so I, a lot of times I think about how what we think is new is actually really longstanding. What we think is absolutely old and forever is actually relatively new innovation. So I think it's good to correct people on what kinds of traditions they're invoking. And just to give an example from my own field um, in the history of marriage and family and sexuality, you often hear people talking about the simpler families of the past or invoking traditional family values, but they don't necessarily think, for example, that in colonial Puritan um, families, those were really complex families often, and death and desertion um, performed some of the same functions that divorce does now. You had very, very complex families of step-siblings and multiple marriages, or people call for a return to family values around sexuality and around abortion law. Well, abortion law, 
it was not illegal until the 1800s. So to think about what traditions you're invoking can change how you, um, the, the political claims that you're making, and historians can kind of fact check on that. Um, wanna, so let's let's talk a little bit more about the critique that Temkin has in that article. So he's the uh, so that's at the New York Times piece, um, and it had as as many of you have already pointed to, it's about analogies. Right? That that's the problem. Temkin Temkin says that it's actually important for historians. So he says it's it's an interesting piece because about midway through Temkin says, yeah, actually it is important for historians to be involved in a very specific way, and he, and and it's. The most important thing historians can do is provide a critical, uncomfortable account of how we arrived at our seemingly incomprehensible current moment. Which is to say, what historians are good at is talking about how we got to where we are. Where, where they get in trouble, he says, is when they start making analogies, right? Um, you know, this uh, facile analogies, he talks about things rarely repeat themselves, etc. And then Nicole Hemmer, and this was in the, um, I think this was in the Washington Post piece, had something to add about this, and, and she wrote, there is a real danger here, a false sense of security when you use analogies, a sense that we know what's coming next and how to respond. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about the very real dangers of analogies, both poor ones, as well as you know maybe ones that are actually kind of accurate or that aren't these facile analogies. So what are the, maybe we could talk about the strengths or weaknesses or, or dangers of analogies. I guess I'll start. <laughs> so, so thinking of some of the examples that were given in that article, and, and for those of you that didn't read it, it talked about analogies between Trump and everyone from Huey Long in Louisiana to Hitler. Um, and I think that what, to go back to something that you were saying before, I, I think what historians can provide is, if we're given more than a 30 second soundbite, of course, um, is, a more thorough analysis of the particular times in which these various figures arose. And so it may be that Donald Trump has certain personality traits that remind us of this historical figure or that historical figure, but what the responsible pundit will do is talk about the difference in the larger circumstance in which he's operating. Right, so, so one wouldn't just leave it at the analogy. Okay, but why would you do it in the first, I'm just gonna talk loudly. Um, why would you even do it in the first, what's the point of, of drawing an analogy, of, of drawing a comparison between the past and the present? Where does that get us? I mean, it's a fun exercise, you know, it's similar to the past, but why would we even bother doing that in the first place? And Ellen, I'm looking at you, but there are other people with microphones too that I would encourage to respond. Why even bother with analogies? If it's if it's so easy to make bad ones, why do we even try it all? There is this presumption that we can learn from the past. And the past has something to teach us about the present. The most important thing I think probably the past has to teach us about the present. Um, and I think this is one of the one of the great contributions of history as opposed to to the social sciences is the understanding that just how contingent things are. Right. That until something actually has happened, almost anything could happen. That human action and agency and just plain luck will play a huge part in how things actually play out now and now and in the future. Now, every other social scientist tends to think in terms of understanding causal relationships and to create and understand causal laws. One of the great things about historians is they're extremely skeptical, uh, at least professionally as part of the discipline of such causal laws, recognizing that in fact, Every circumstance, every time, every place, is somehow different from every other. At the same time, every historian also understands Vico's fundamental insight that human beings are human beings, 
And as human beings, we have a profound ability to understand each other. That is the great insight which historians bring to bear in trying to make sense of any kind of analogy. The big difference between bad analogizing and good analogizing is an understanding of the exact match of circumstances. How much you have to bring to bear in order for an analogy to work. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, that the example given in the reading is especially telling is that it wants us to compare Trump to some previous politician, a president, a dictator, a leader. That's very hard to do. Um, and that not only because of his funny hairdo. <laughs> um, I've often tried to do that myself and tried to find an analogy and the best I've been able to come up with is perhaps Johnny O'Quadros or perhaps um, uh, Silvio Berlusconi and they're not very good. Go ahead, Andra. Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah, I was just, to kind of get back to the question of analogies, I it's worth considering maybe how different analogies are from just comparisons. I mean, comparisons are kind of the bread and butter of what we're teaching students and what we're what we're doing. Um, even though most historians typically choose a you know very specialized topic, and most of us don't write comparative histories, you're at least expected to know like what is why is this um, you know very specific instance? Why does it matter in the, in the larger scale of things? And and the implicit assumption there is that you're doing some form of comparison. Um, and I'm thinking especially of comparisons maybe um, across uh, places, you know, different countries. And so, and as I think maybe the only non-US historian maybe on, on the panel, um, I think one role of historians is to, not only to sort of intervene in the, the 24 hour news cycle, but also to remind the public of everything else that's going on in the world and maybe how the US is not necessarily exceptional. And so I think that one kind of political uh, value of analogies or comparisons is to get away from the exceptionalism of, oh, you know, the US political context is so, it's so crazy right now and if we can't understand it, you know, it's impossible to understand both in our own history and compared to the rest of the world, but um, to sort of step back from that perspective. And I, and I study Chile, which I think maybe every country has its own form of exceptionalism, but Chileans certainly do. They think, you know, we're the sort of model democracy in Latin America, but that is also a myth. So I think analogies and comparisons can serve that function. Just so everybody knows, Taproot's shutting things down. If you want to grab one last beer, it's available. David, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I guess I want to step a little bit outside of um, the topic a little bit, or the, the current question. I was thinking about something about the slogan that Trump used for his whole campaign, Make America Great Again. And I, I think, you know, the way that all rolled out, he's almost like daring historians to tell you what America was like in the past. <laughs> and, and that invites, he's actually inviting the analogies. You know, he's, he's saying, let's make America great again. And people are saying, wait a minute, do I want to, you know, have my, women are saying, do I want to have my dresses down to my, you know, shoes and, and, and be the second tier worker in the household? and be at home and you know all, you know this whole World War II type attitude so I mean is that what you really want Do you really want that sort of male dominated culture and so he's kind of inviting us almost teasing academics and historians to say something and say wait a minute you're, you're wrong about that your whole idea about great in the past is completely wrong even though he apparently appealed to a lot of people by saying that. So, I, and I, and I don't, and, and it just, just seems to me that that, really that invites that, you know, that's I guess, the one thing I have to say. Analogies seek to make things simple. Many people find comfort in that simplicity and our job is to make things complicated. Our job as citizens is to see things that, for their complications. So I think analogies in some ways provide for some people some comfort. 
for seeming to provide an answer. And in some of the readings that we did, an answer where Hitler was defeated, right? That there's a, the, that embedded in that analogy is the, the hope that there will be uh, a victory. And I also think that um, one of the, um, one of the things I think is really important for us to think about is, and I, I uh, use George Orwell's 1984, that many of you may know, that history is for a, a community what memory is to an individual. And so those memories are important. It helps me remember what my keys go to, and it helps me remember what I need to do and where the Oregon State Archives is. But that that is very different from uh, a, a pattern where, you know, if only I will do this, then everything will be the same. It's, it's really hard to try to break through the idea that people want something, a very simple answer. And I think that's what an analogy false promise of an analogy is that there's a simplistic answer to that. And yeah. I thought your comparison was really important. <laughs> Comparisons are, by their very nature, inviting us to think critically. I think the thing that, that I find uh, in the criticism of, of historians uh, that we're not apolitical. Who is apolitical? I mean, that's just a, a ridiculous concept. We all should care, we all should know. And the, the criticism that in the, the pieces that the historians are writing is that we're being political. Yes, of course we are. That's what we should be. I just was gonna go back to David's comment about Trump sort of daring people. I, I really agree with, with that by using um, terms like America first and, and all of that, which evokes a very specific kind of history. And so you go from the big, which is uh, this American first slogan to something that, that is very particular, just to take one example from this week, um, the idea that the Russians wanted to meet with um, Trump Jr. And of course he took the meeting because who wouldn't take the meeting? And it's totally normal to take a meeting with an email like that. And then very quickly, historians more knowledgeable about past campaigns than I came up with a number of previous examples, like from the Kennedy administration, that demonstrate that in fact what he is, what what both Don Jr. and Sr. are proclaiming to be sort of obvious, so anyone would do this, is actually not valid. I'm interested um, for folks to talk about um, historians not just analyzing change, but potentially making change. And um, in the New York Times article, uh, he mentioned C. Van Woodward, who wrote The Strange Career of Jim Crow, and talked about how Jim Crow did not just extend, and segregation did not just extend immediately out of slavery, but was consciously constructed in the 1890s. And it's, so it wasn't this long, ancient Southern tradition, it was a new product of 1890s. And he pointed to that historian as it became the Bible of the civil rights movement, so that people understood that segregation was not natural and inevitable, but actually a human construct that could be challenged and changed. But I'm interested if you have folks in mind that you, as historians, who have been particularly good pundits, I'm not gonna to point to a particular historian, but I'm a member of a group called the Immigration and Ethnic History Society, which has been very active um, in this past year and produced sample syllabi and so on. And I know as an immigration historian, um, and I just happen to be teaching immigration history this past semester, and current events came together with history in a way that um, was quite different from when I've taught it in the past. And I found myself testifying, for example, at the city council meeting, considering whether Salem should be a, um, a sanctuary, a welcoming um, city. But, but that whole network of immigration historians has been very vocal in challenging um, a number of the um, truths that Trump puts forward to defend him, his immigration policy, going all the way back to the campaign when they were talking about 
even the possibilities of internment and so on. So I'm bringing up analogies to World War II era policies. I was thinking of um, sort of political historians. Uh, there's a lot of, I guess, CNN or other news sites have political historians. Even some of the comedians, you know, like John Stewart, were particularly good at finding, I mean, they probably had a huge staff, but they finding histories of what people have said in the past or done in the past, and then bringing that out into the public on their shows and really kind of putting it to those folks that are trying to, to suggest a different kind of history. And, and those sort of political and I guess comedy historians have been a particularly good thing. One of the things that I think it would be good, and it's being done a little bit, but uh, as Ellen says, the whole issue of immigration, let's look back at the Know Nothings, the Ku Klux Klan, I mean these, uh, organizations were absolutely terrible in terms of immigration. Now, I, I don't know what your backgrounds are. Uh, mine is a little bit longer in the, in the States. My husband, three of his grandparents came from Ireland as teenagers. You know, it's a different, a whole different concept. And we need to be reminded that that's the way we came to be. And I, I do think that, you know, immigrants are rapists and immigrants, are, it's just unbelievable that anyone listens to that. He's looking something up. Yeah. <laughs> you notice, he's you. Um, I remember as a young person, I thought I was the first person to ever be bad. You know, that I invented getting in trouble. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you understand, do you, you relate to that? And I think in a larger sense, and I, I'm gonna use just an analogy from some of my teaching as well. I remember uh, talking about the United States uh, war with Mexico from 1846 to 48, essentially, uh, grabbed uh, most of the West. And I remember I had a student that said, why are we talking about this now? And it was, I, I asked the student to come see me because I didn't know what to say. And I realized that the student was saying, in my world, Mexican Americans are part of the 21st century. And they've entered here, it's a, they are, their migration is a new problem. And I think that's reflected so much in what we hear. And so for historians to be raising issues of immigration, I also thought about many experiences of contributing to being a Friends of the Court briefs, to take some time to talk about what you mentioned, uh, what marriage is like, what the, that abortion was not criminal, that all of those ways that there's a it's an advocacy by using your own research to, to acknowledge that. And so I think that in so many ways, understanding there's a broad history that we are a history of immigrants, that we are, uh, that, that, you know, gender identity is not something from 2017. That's so important. And, and so when we can help students and the public think more deeply about that past, I think there's a, a perspective that comes that's so important. And you know, back to Ellen's point about immigration. So I think that's really um, a powerful part there that we, we don't want to be presentist, that we want to see that those that history. And I think Bob has found, found this the thing. I found the thing I was looking for, I found the thing. So the question you asked was about who's doing this well. And um, uh, uh, I, in the blurb for tonight, I think I referenced the Washington Post's new section, Made by History. Um, it's Made by History, isn't it? Yeah, Made by History. And it's edited by Nicole Hemmer, um, who goes under at Past Punditry. Um, and she also has a podcast that she does with some other people. Um, uh, at, she, she's at the Miller Center over in Virginia. She's very, very good at this sort of thing, of looking at the past. Uh, making good analogies, finding the good analogies, doing all of these things really well. So I look, I look to her 
uh, and the people that she works with is, is a great example of this. And I think we've actually been doing a pretty good job here in this series. You know, um, I think that that's kind of what we've been shooting for, or 